Hello, and welcome to the MIT SDM Systems Thinking webinar series. My name is Naomi Gutierrez, Communications Administrator for SDM, and I am today's host. Thank you for joining us. Today's speaker is Jean Ellison, Assistant Professor of Analytics in the College of Business at Alfred University. Following a successful career as a Xerox executive, working in the United States, India, and Europe, Jean made the transition to academia in 2019. She holds the John and Mary Tabor Chair in Family Business and Entrepreneurship, sharing her experience and knowledge with students striving to make a positive difference. Jean is an alum of the SDM program, earning her Master's in Engineering and Management in 2001, and also holds a Master's in Applied Statistics from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Her talk today is titled, In Quest of Inclusive Engagement. If you have questions for Jean, please enter them into the chat window at the side of the video. They will be addressed during the Q&A portion of this session. The recording of this presentation will be available online after today's session, and a link will be sent to all registrants. Jean, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you for joining and listening to me today. Um, I'm hoping to talk on an important topic and ideally get some thoughts flowing and, and share my journey through this as well as hopefully uh, can help you continue yours. Um, so I wanted to start with that. Um, we go. So obviously, being from the systems engineering and systems design and management background, systems are systems. And when I joined the academic workforce and became a professor, I really wanted to understand my role better and get better at it. And I knew that would require a little specific work on my part. Um, and so I found this, uh, this goal, uh, college learning experience, essential work of an undergraduate college is to open students' minds to important ideas, help them acquire knowledge and skills and areas of lasting value and develop capacities that will help them succeed in their careers, but also improve society, right? And that resonated with me. Um, and one of the things that I found about that is the system and dynamic that's at work is that engagement and building identity is critical to the success of, of teaching and ideally to of the um, student who is learning and moving forward. Um, and then what is more critical for engagement is effective engagement of everyone. So that's really what I wanted to explore and understand is how that brings us together. And you'll see, I just have a quick kind of um, system in my mind uh, that comes through here and from what I've read and, and seen from a research perspective, engagement, um, certainly bad or good, um, increases or decreases student or employee outcomes, increases or decreases institutional health, and likewise engagement again and again. Um, and as we like are usually when we have these um, reinforcing uh, loops. We like them to be positive in our favor. Um, so I wanted to figure out how to do that appropriately and therefore I started to explore and to learn. And of course, what does every good systems <laughs> engineer do but come up with a standard operating procedure, SOP, and a checklist. So of course I went out in the world and I benchmarked and I looked for what existed and I put together the bits and pieces that looked reasonable to me. And I began to do some research on them. And in fact, at, the, at this, I have a shared Google Docs that has this checklist that I've started to use. I've been encouraging my peers to use, and I hope other people um, also take it and engage with it. Um, the ones that I did find out there, none of them kind of satisfied what I wanted. And so I started to cobble them together and I started to learn a lot more. Um, so for each of those, the question that I asked myself about the course and work to change it, why I'm doing that, the elaboration, some sort of supporting material if it was available. And then of course, as we move to the research world, some sort of peer reviewed article that provides some sort of data validation that this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, and I took that really a little bit like the, the penguin walking out the door and one step at a time. Is this better than what I'm doing now, which is probably something that I just grew up with um, and therefore I'm willing to make the change um, and just step improvement, stepwise improvement here. Um, and so, in fact, if you want to see the detail of this, if you, you know, search Gene Ellison Alfred Berggren Forum, um, you can certainly watch a, a more detailed kind of our presentation specifically around this checklist, the questions, and what I learned and what I recommend for a checklist. Um, but today, I thought rather than rehash that, which is already available on YouTube, I wanted to go a step further and really get to a slightly higher level of system than just in the classroom. And of course, we have uh, the famed John Sherman, providing his words of wisdom in our business dynamics text and really looking at systems thinking and to avoid policy resistance and find high leverage policies requiring us to expand our boundaries of our mental models. 
and finding those, learning the structure and dynamics. Obviously, these systems that were embedded are pretty complex, especially when I started to realize the, um, you know, the realities of the classroom and teaching very disparate groups and the cultural divides of students within there and potentially the cultural divide either perceived or real between me and many of my students. I wanted to figure out how to close that. Um, and of course, I also wanted to mention Jim Hines for, for those of us who are recalling back to our SDM days, a fantastic uh, resource and my mentor from System Dynamics, um, who I enjoyed being a teaching assistant for many years after the SDM program as well, um, to keep my hand in. But what I found in these systems is that this is not a unique system to my university, Alfred University, nor is it a unique system to universities across the US and even the world show many of these similar experiences. And in fact, it's, in truth, it's not even a, a unique system to universities because when we talk about employee engagement, many of these are exactly the same things with senior level managers or senior people in the, in the firm being very similar to faculty and administration in a university setting. Um, so really thinking about that starts us to really realize uh, the gaps that we can close and that exist in all of these systems. So I took these and really looked, I got the, brought these together and had this best of breed and course engagement fed in by these systems models that were in my mind and looking for these reinforcing loops and balancing loops that I wanted to help with. And I had three main areas of concern that I found in the literature, as well as recognized in my class. I had content, how diverse, how do I reflect inclusive diversity in content? And in fact, what we find is that kind of health and money and home are universal topics everybody's kind of interested. So if you put them into a stats class, your engagement increases and your performance increases. Um, if you do kind of things that are boring to lots of groups, you probably don't have the same kind of engagement. Um, as well as how biased is the, um, is the content. Certainly historical uh, tends to be very biased to European civilization and Western Civ. Um, but there's definitely fixes to that. But how do I get content that's relevant to all? How do I get the interaction going? How do I, you know, make sure that I greet people, use their name, and how do I do those types of things? And how do I make sure I get to know them and understand their backgrounds and don't make them based on these kind of birth categories, if you will? And then the mechanics. How do I enable multiple channels? How do I deal with students who aren't used to engaging with infrastructure or negotiate for their own positions? How do I deal with people who may be better at video or text or audio, and how do I make all of those available in this kind of multi-dimensional world and omni-channel world that we live in? And how do I make sure that the focus is on learning the material and being able to use it in the world and not the mechanics that we grew up with as thinking that they're the right thing to do when we're preparing an organization and, and many people to go into a manufacturing workforce and now realizing that we're preparing them to go into a creative workforce. Um, and what are those skills that they're going to need and how does that match how we're teaching? So those were kind of the things that I started to look at. And then the other thing that I found is people were like, well, talk, you know, do you know colored people or people of color, <laughs> BIPOC, right? Um, so what, where is that and what do you have? And, and I, when I talked to a few of those friends of mine who said, look, you know, we're just sick of talking about this. We've been talking about this for ages just because you know, you guys suddenly want to get woke doesn't mean we want to spend all our time rehashing this or being called into a meeting to be listened to again. We've told you. Nobody's done anything. We're tired of talking. Um, and so one of those things that I did was really just immerse myself in trying to get an understanding. And I want to call back to uh, Dana Meadows quote, um, the scarcest resource is not oil, metals, clean air, capital, labor, or technology. It is our willingness to listen to each other and learn from each other and to seek the truth rather than seek to be right. Um, I know my, my younger self needed to be reminded that a lot. I like to think my older self's a little more on the truth finding, um, but definitely these are a lot of the resources that I went ahead and found. So um, my, my kids got to enjoy a lot of reading of, of recommended books to understand this a bit better. Um, we also, I also did a couple reading books with the university with my colleagues and my peers that allowed me to understand this. Some of these are great background reads, some of these are great shows, a lot of audio books and podcasts. Um, folks like Carla Harris at Morgan Stanley does a great access and opportunity. Um, so there's all of these opportunities to start to get this other view. There's a few white advocates as well that are talking about, you know, how do how are we white in this area and how do we do with this? And I just started to absorb all of those through you know, my daily commute and listening and my, my reading on the side or my watching um, while rowing or whatever else I was doing. So 
Um, this was what I did in order to do that. And you know, be aware that there are these other resources out there that can start to give you a background of knowledge um, that doesn't rely on, on people doing more work so that you can understand or we can understand. Um, but that's definitely something that helped me um, get a little bit further in, in my understanding. And what that allowed me to put together was really for each of these big spaces that I had, the contents, um, contents mechanics, and interrelationship, is to put together these questions to ask, the research that supports. And the other thing that I really wanted to do, and um, luckily I had a graduate assistant that was very tied into this, so thanks to Janu Patel for monitoring and looking at these things on Facebook and being connected to these student groups that were already talking about these topics. And so I wanted to bring in the quotes from these people when I was having these conversations with some of my peers. It, it, it seemed urgent to me and maybe not so urgent um, to other people around me. So I really wanted to say, you know, is this relevant to us? We're living, you know, Western New York, we're way up in the North, all of these reasons, you know, it's 2020, um, these things have passed, it's now 2021. Um, why do we need to worry about these things? But when we looked at even, you know, recent alumni and talked to current students who in lots of instances were really afraid of bringing these things up and alumni that came back and talked to people in our kind of anti-racist action committee um, and talked to their previous professors and said, look, this was, you know, I wanted to talk to you about this and I'm hoping it can change for future generations. And we were able to listen to that, right? And so I offered some of these quotes from those students um, to be able to add some, you know, reality that this is still going on and experienced. And, and while some may have thought, oh, you know, we don't want to talk about those things because people will, you know, realize that we have problems, what we found is that, in fact, um, the people in the BIPOC space certainly realize that we have problems and the fact that we're starting to talk about them actually is a step forward from the still, real, still not realizing that they exist. So they know they're there. Um, in fact, there are lots of articles about PWIs, which was a new term for me, otherwise known as a predominantly white institution, which is in fact most of our universities and most of our, um, most of our workplaces as well, or many of our workplaces, but with the majority of the Fortune 500. Um, so that really gave me some more insight that I had a lot more to learn and needed to kind of follow Dana's suggestions and listen for truth and, and go out and do some more research. Um, there is this continuous conversation about the N-word and whether or not, you know, if you're reading it aloud in literature, does it count and is it okay? Um, and yet still, as, you know, I think uh, one, of, one of the few members of my, my class that were female, I really wouldn't want to read literature about, you know, with horrible words for women and have to sit there in the class as one of the few women. And I certainly would not want to be one of the few Black people sitting in a class where the N-word is being read with, with authority and confidence. Um, so I think that that some of that is how you frame um, this discussion of integrating people and making them understand and making them feel that, yes, it's, it's okay and legal, but how do you do that? And so many of these quotes allowed us to understand and be able to um, realize what was going on, at least in the minds of the students. Um, and so this is the kind of flow that I followed there. And then today, I just wanted to keep um, some of the the quotes that we had here as well, right? So these are others, you know, predominantly uh, mixing up names. And again, this came up during uh, presidential elections, right? The mis mispronunciation uh, of certain names. Um, and, and really it, it's taken together as, as pretty offensive and frustrating for students. Um, and it's definitely one of the things that they remember. Um, and I think if we talk to kind of cognitive overload, which I'll go into a little bit, but certainly we as system students and systems thinkers understand that accumulation is a very real phenomenon and causes different things. And I think one of the things, what we, when we read each of these um, incidents or each of these stories, um, many of them can be dismissed as an individual event. Um, and I think what we need to put together is that, unfortunately, they don't happen as an individual event, but in fact, they happen as groupings over a period of time, and therefore, there's an accumulation effect that results in disengagement. And so it's really trying to figure out how we come about that. Um, so I have to say, this picture on the upper left, I happen to have taken off of our recruitment page. Um, so on this recruitment page, so um, Alfred, interestingly enough, is the Saxons, and we talk about the Saxon nation being amazing, and I noticed one of my, although I understand this is changing, one of my advisees um, was enrolled in a class called, you know, Becoming a Saxon, 
um, which as a mascot is is an interesting choice, of course, and but as this whole language around it becomes and this idea of a warrior, a white male warrior um, being the greeting person perhaps is a different lens coming into it depending on your background and other things that have accumulated to you um, is your social heritage and um, in this place that may be taken very, very differently. Um, and in fact, if we if we kind of look on the, the a few of the faces in the background uh, that look slightly less engaged than their enthusiastic counterparts in front, um, we might think that maybe this is a slightly different version of the inclusive lens and maybe this is a different picture um, to be used for enthusiasm. Um, but certainly that's a, a kind of new view that I've had since doing a, a number of this kind of research and reading these things and trying to understand a bit more. Um, and then a number of stories are those, right? Certainly the go back to where you're from, which still still seems to be happening. Um, groups shouting at black people about how black history months shouldn't be a thing. Um, and certainly obviously the students were of, of no part of that. Um, so those are the kind of things that we start to see in the stories that we heard forward and the things that our students um, still remembered um, after graduation. Um, the other areas that we had um, was really around kind of hairstyles and showing of ethnicity. Um, certainly the uh, um, please don't touch me, I'm not some damn pet, I'm tired of people touching my hair. Um, there's actually a children's book of poems that uh, don't touch my hair. Um, and well, um, much of our faculty seems to be in denial associated with these things happening or with them being significant. Um, certainly the, the folks of color that I speak to know that this is a reality for them. Um, so that's certainly the case. Um, the, also the making assumptions around socioeconomic state status. Um, well, there are um, socioeconomic and systemic issues that we need to deal with, making the assumption that everyone who appears a certain way is one portion of that and everyone who appears a different way is a different portion of that. As we know, statistics help us understand um, the population but are not very good predictors of individual points. Um, so we need to remember that as well when we're, we're thinking about those things. Um, and then a few examples of this. So one student remembers uh, being called out um, on the, do you think the Black Panthers were a terrorist group? Um, and apparently was, I think, the only student in the class um, that was a person of color. And immediately the question was directed to that person and saying, hey, I'm like, I don't want to answer that. So like, sir, you already know what I'm going to say about this, but I want to know what these 23 white kids are thinking. Right? What are they thinking about in this class? And I think these start to give us an idea of the experience that, that is um, put forward. Um, the other thing that we talked about and actually came up in a, a somewhat recent interview with Ursula Burns, former CEO for Xerox, um, regarding being in a room um, when some of the atrocities and, and um, uh, police brutality news stories came across and having the people not think that it applied to them because um, for, for whatever reasons. Um, and our students felt this as well. So um, we see it both in the research and the data, as well as in this particular instance, saying that no one ever wanted to pause their lesson for a day or two to talk about the disgusting atrocities. They didn't even utter a word. They expected students of color to see process and go back to classes like normal. And they never stood for us and never took the initiative to teach our history or learn about it when it was sorely needed. Um, so this is a, a talk to as well, which I think we can also consider how that might apply in the business world um, when these things are going on and, and do we pause or do we continue and what sort of things do we pause for and talk about and what sort of things do we continue on. Um, so those are the, the kind of areas that we have and the, the way that I started to try to listen and find out what the truth was. Um, so the other thing that I researched was associated with our student body and our differently diverse faculty. So um, I know this has come up even in conversations I've been in with faculty where they say, well, but we are diverse. Um, and in fact, we have a very good score. This is our um, Alfred's diversity score, according to College Factual. Um, we have good ethnic diversity compared to the national average, well above for ethnic, gender, geographical, and overall. We're actually quite diverse um, as a university. In fact, it's one of our three high rankings on uh, College Factual for why you would choose to go to our university. Um, and some of our professors have the idea that we are, um, in fact, um, diverse. And if you look at this, in fact, we do have some fairly high um, diversity numbers. Um, but if we look at them compared to our students, and here I just did a comparison of the ratios, 
Um, so you can see kind of this would be where the center line here would be where the ratio of students is similar to the ratio of um, professors. You see, in fact, we do have um, many more Asian professors or faculty than we do students. We have more resident aliens than we have students. Um, we have a few more whites than we have students, um, but we're significantly lacking in our Hispanics um, compared to our student body, certainly significant lacking in our Black or African American, and, um, and, and this poor, this poor point four has, has no counterpart on the faculty. Um, so we definitely do have areas where um, underrepresented in faculty, so a conscious effort is required to really understand the needs and make sure that those students feel represented and make sure that they feel be, being heard and make sure that they have someone to go to um, to have those conversations. Um, another um, illustrative picture that I took here is Mark Zupan, the president of our university, um, a, a view book photo, right, a typical um, admissions virtual tour photo with a lot of students. And in fact, this is what we see in many of the students' comments as well. Um, a bunch of old white people on the faculty and a bunch of diverse students. Um, and in fact, this is a, a very illustrative photo of in fact, a, a slightly different lens on, on what that picture is showing. Um, but certainly again, you know, when I reflect on time in, in, um, in corporations and work that I do with corporations, that's certainly another lens that is useful to view in if you want people to feel a part of your organization and become to that point of belonging. Um, so one of those, as I, as I looked at this, in fact, and I, and I realized that we needed to reach out more, and I, frankly, we needed an adjunct. We need a few adjuncts we were looking for, and, and we're also also looking for professors. So I reached out to one of my colleagues from who used to be at Xerox with me, who I consider extremely competent and, and actually a wonderful resource. And I said, hey, we're, we're looking for a, 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 someone to teach a course, and I was wondering if you would be willing. I think you'd be really good at it. Here's what we're talking about. And in fact, she said to me, well, why don't you go and listen to my podcast? Because I'm a little worried that I wouldn't be accepted in this um, because I have some views. And in fact, her views were very similar to, I, I also gave her the video of my um, Bergren forum, which I mentioned earlier and said, well, why don't you go listen to mine? Um, and I think she listened to mine and said, wow, I'm, I'm really excited that people are having these conversations. Um, and there's a lot of insights in there that I, I haven't heard someone talk about who's white before. And I'm happy to see that. And I said, listen to hers. And I said, wow, I'm, I'm glad that you're being verbal about this. And that's okay with me too. And I think that would actually be a good thing for our students to understand that people have those views and, and we accept them as part. Um, so in fact, and, and part of the podcast that she had me listen to, in fact, included some quotes about her time at Xerox with me. Um, and she had said, when she got her job on Xerox at Xerox after, you know, I think four or five interviews, a kind of a lengthy interview process, they had reached out to her because of her social media and said, hey, we, you know, like to talk to you about coming on board, um, that her mom had said to her, I'm really proud of you and I want you to be proud that you achieved this, but I want you to go into this with a very clear understanding that these people are never going to accept you. And she was very, very right. I felt like I was always in a world where I did not belong and I was not made for it. Now, this was a corporation where she joined. This is a picture of Ursula Burns, the, I think, first white CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Um, uh, so certainly a, a, a company where she would see somebody a little bit like her, at least, um, running at the helm. Um, but yet it, it bothered me, in fact, that, um, that her reaction from her parents was so very different from my reaction from my parents when I got my job at Xerox, right? For us, it was kind of a celebration. Um, and for her, it was a warning that you will never, ever fit in. Um, and I was, I was wondering for myself if my parents had told me, well, that's all good and all, but I, you'll never, ever fit in if I ever would felt like I felt it fit in and how tenuous that feeling of belonging really is for everyone. Um, and with this, this kind of pre-baggage, what would that be? Um, so I re just reflected on that to the story. Um, I would mention uh, it's an interesting listen to that, and, and she is a fantastic uh, search engine optimizer as well, among other things, and that's her, her company link there. Um, the other thing I have the opportunity to do is um, I'm on the board for the United Way of Greater Rochester, um, and one of the things that we look at a lot is really um, we work with the anti-poverty initiative that we have here locally, um, and we look at a lot of the data associated with the uh, um, wealth and health impacts that we have here in uh, the Western New York. And the things that still continue to shock me, and in fact, we, a couple weeks ago, we had this presentation that reminded me of these 
kind of cold hard facts that we have locally. Um, so the median net worth, um, this is actually a US number. Um, if we look at this, this lovely graph, if you will with me, um, the median net worth, so kind of what you're worth with all those balances and takes, um, white family, uh, kind of up there, kind of 170K, right? So if you kind of wiped everything out, what would you have left? You'd have 170K in the bank, all your assets and debits. Um, by the same token, um, Black families are down here at about 17K, which I think is um, obviously a, a pretty big difference between those two things. Um, the other thing that we start to have with these facts is uh, grade eight proficiency in math. We can start to look at that um, overall. Uh, Asian and whites up here at 21, 22%, um, black and Latinos, African American and Latinos, five and 4%. Um, unemployment rates uh, by ethnicity, um, again, African American at 18% unemployment for our nine county region, um, Latinos at 13%, Asians and whites at 6%. Percent of income paid for rent, so of their household income, how much of that do they have to pay in rent? African Americans pay 47% of that in rent, um, and Asians 28 and whites 30% and Latinos uh, at 40%. So really looking at the realities of, of daily life, um, and these are all um, you know, within the past three years. So really looking at very current numbers. Um, and then we went back a little bit in history. So we had a special speaker that I'll, I'll introduce in a moment, um, at least in pictures. Um, and really started to look at local Rochester. So I know sometimes when we talk about race, um, we talk about you know Lincoln freed the slaves, uh, Juneteenth is coming up as a celebration. Um, we also talk about um, you know, immigrants come in, people work hard, they get good educations. Um, Jim Crow laws, well, those were down in the South. Um, so a few local folks started to look at the local history here in Rochester and in Western New York and started to really understand what are causing these things. Um, so in fact, in that, so some of that local Rochester, New York history, um, the FHA and VA, so the um, Federal Housing Administration and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, um, kind of 1947, just after the war, lots of people coming back, gave out $119 billion in mortgage insurance. Um, over the 35 million families benefited from that, and 98% of them were white. And in fact, there are a number of... Um, uh, stories, at least in Rochester, where some of the wards were restricted only to white people and blacks. And in fact, at this time, it seems Italians and Jews were in part of that same category, were restricted to a few wards that they were allowed to live in. Um, and in fact, allowed is, is pretty strong, um, in fact. So there are many restrictive land covenants in Monroe County. And in fact, this is taken directly from some of those documents. So no persons of any race other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building or any lot, except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race domiciled with an owner or a tenant. Um, and the other things we start to see is even the underwriting manual of the 1936 for the Federal Housing Administration would write things, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in value. And that were, those were some of the areas when we hear things like redlining um, that comes in, that uh, people were very much restricted from that. And in fact, the real estate association, if you had a realtor's license, you were restricted from showing people who are not of the same race or social status as the people who are already in a neighborhood, um, you were restricted from doing that and they would clear license if you did that. Um, a number, there's a number of stories in Rochester of people still living that will tell of friends who are white that would buy houses for them and then they would buy it from them um, as they weren't able to be sold directly to them by people in the neighborhood. Um, so there's definitely those stories. Um, the other thing that I think came as a bit of a surprise is um, this is a local school district. The Cub Scouts stage a spectacular minstrel show at the school, so literally wearing blackface. Uh, I remember it's kind of the 60s. Um, so starting to look at that and realizing um, and, and continuing the kind of racial stereotypes through these minstrel shows um, that they had. And in fact, even here in 1926, Colorful scene presented as 8,000 Klansmen gather in East Rochester Field. Um, and as we hear the stories of the people who were colored that did move into 
uh, the white neighborhoods at the time. Um, they did receive, you know, threats in their mailbox and, and other harassment um, from folks that thought they shouldn't be there. Um, so we continue to have that. And I think the, um, the quote that I wanted to remember as well from um, J. Wright Forrester, obviously uh, establishing system dynamics, uh, many of the problems the world faces today are the eventual result of short-term measures taken last century. And we can see these problems continue um, in this division um, that we continue to have based on these activities that occurred um, not too long ago from a, um, a family money, money perspective, if you consider those ideas. Um, here's another picture from 71. Um, they started to racially integrate the schools. And in fact, they had people who were um, students who protested that by stoning the bus that the, the students were on um, that were going to the schools. Um, and then even today, um, we continue to have these are 2014 numbers. Um, we can see the uninsured rate. Um, we can see food insecurity. We can see asthma. We can see blood pressure. We can see mental health. Um, there are a number of these that still stick to lines of the redlining um, that existed not too long in the distant past, um, at least for our community, and I expect many communities um, if we start to dig into the history. Um, and this, this lovely picture in the bottom right is actually um, a fourth grade teacher who started to dig into this with some students um, and started to uncover and has been presenting about this and has worked with an organization called Pathstone, um, which I've included the link here, Pathstone Foundation, to create an open source curriculum, um, including case studies to, um, to critically look at historical facts and uncover um, past um, in order to understand our current and future. Um, the other link I've ended, added in here is the Ending Poverty and Now, which is a link to our RMAPI organization um, against poverty initiative. Um, and Shane Wigand is the person who has done this and his YouTube, if you're interested in some of these facts or more information, he does a great YouTube that walks through them um, and what he found um, and how they are continuing to do this from a critical uh, look at critical thinking projects. So I think as we take all of those types of things from where we are in poverty, what types of things are overcoming, um, the, the slights that we have regarding hair and name mispronunciation and the accumulation of that cognitive overload that we have in our society um, for different people, uh, those little things can really add up to be significant. Most, arguably all, in individuals can be dismissed, the individual incidents, right, as not a big deal. Um, but it's the difference between being allowed and being integral and, and having that feeling of belonging, I think. Um, so if we think about the levels of inclusion, and, and here, in fact, I have those who were included in, in my SDM class, which oddly I had on my hard drive, um, and really looking at the, um, the flow and the kind of Venn diagram of that, right? So this integral belonging, how are you a part of a thing or a group? How are you welcomed and how are you allowed? And we've seen this in, in lots of different areas, right? Whether it's, um, are you allowed on the golf course? Are you allowed in the locker room? Are you, allowed, are you welcomed? Or are you integral and in belonging and you're part of the gang and part of the group? And it really causes at least me to stop and think of what does the social fabric look like, right? How is one welcomed to a group, whether it's a work group or a school or a student group? And then how does one belong? Um, and is it different based on your birth package, right? Is it golfing? Is it drinking? Is it um, spending time out? Is it dancing? Is it working hard on a specific project? I think um, those of us in engineering or systems design and development um, may create great relationships and definitely feel like we're belong as we're working toward a product launch or working hard on something that's a system that's gonna be developed and implemented. Um, and the birth package goes away pretty quickly. Um, based on the skills that you need. Um, but if you think about what people are doing on the weekends or nights, you know, I was listening to the Elon Musk um, story and I was intrigued by his idea that he specifically was looking for people who had no families, right? He would call up departments and say, who do you have that's a really good student but has no family? Um, and then later in the book was lamenting that uh, smart women didn't tend to have kids. Uh, I said, well, if you wanna solve one problem, it's how do you get smart women to be able to have children and raise them? while also having a career at companies like Elon Musk's company. Right? Um, <clears throat> but it, is it does talk to what is the social fabric and how are we welcomed and how, what do we look like? Um, and how does, how do we, what do we have for mentoring? And what do we have for 
setting up and how do we do that? And that's one of the challenges that I've started to talk about with some of my um, colleagues as well, right? So who do we look for in our classes? And how do we make sure that they have apprentices set up? How do we make sure that they have uh, mentor programs set up if they don't have that experience, right? Some are coming from families where they already have people in the, maybe people who are faculty, maybe people who are already engineers or managers at big companies. And some people might come from an area where they have none of that, um, where this is a whole new thing for them. Right? I know when I got to university, I was actually, I, at first I just thought everyone who was important was named Dean and I wondered how their parents knew. Um, it took a while to figure out that, you know, Dean was a position name, um, but that's all part of the social fabric that one becomes accustomed to and learns from the people around them and how much adjustment is required and therefore how much do you feel like you belong and that you're not an imposter or you're not just tolerated and how much does that affect your ability to engage with the material, engage with the work and feel like you can bring that, right? So it's worthwhile to spend some thoughts. I found that illustrative for myself. So another Dana Meadows quote, and so we are brought to the gap between understanding and implementation. Systems thinking by itself cannot bridge that gap, but it can lead us to the edge of what analysis can do and then point beyond to what can and must be done by the human spirit. Um, in fact, well, I haven't created a formal model. Um, certainly we can see a lot of the dynamics starting to flow. And one of the other models that I came across that at least helped me through my own experiences. And in fact, this is a kind of 1990s-ish model by Janet Helms uh, on white racial identity kind of development and what stages we seem to go through. And it certainly resonated with me. Um, there are many more models that are, are um, intersectionality models that have kind of moved forward from this. Um, but for me, I found this illustrative, at least to help me go through this. Um, so from a kind of beginning at that kind of colorblind mentality, like, oh, that person's black, I didn't realize, which I, I recalled myself having those conversations. Um, and then this kind of disintegration where you have, you know, you start to realize, oh, um, I guess there are these kind of um, differences in the world. And there's clearly these issues where I get something and they don't, or vice versa, depending on what it is. and and what a horrible culture we may be in. And then there's this kind of reintegration of that, like, well, if they just, you know, would work harder in school or do something different, maybe it would be different. Um, and then there's also kind of pseudo independence, right? The getting to challenge and say, well, we need to fix this and how can we fix this? Um, but how do we hold this kind of me as a white person along with this kind of, but our society needs to be changed in some manner and how do we start to bring those things together? Um, and then getting to this immersion or immersion where you start to build these frameworks and try to understand your systemic change changes in society that may need to be had, concerned about, you know, bringing everybody forward and trying to move forward and how do you start to have that understanding of what you do. And then really getting to ideally some sort of endpoint, although zipping back and forth of these is certainly understandable, but you start to have a clear understanding of your identity. Um, you know, usually we don't stand up and say, hey, I'm white. Um, there's a couple couple groups that do that, um, but it's not um, in a lot of my my circles. It's not necessarily um, the same as claiming other ethnic ethnic backgrounds um, or races. Um, but trying to figure out how we claim that positive both for ourselves and for our children, so they're um, comfortable with who they are, is certainly the goal, and that we all work together to actively pursue social justice and make sure that we are all can, can move forward. Um, so I have found this uh, racial identity development model helpful, at least to explain kind of my cruisings through uh, my personal transformation and coming to grips with this. I think the other, um, the other kind of actions that we see happening around us, right? So what do we do now that we understand some of these models? Um, 2020 and 2021, UPS lifts their ban on being authentic. Um, so with, I don't know if folks saw this in the news, I happened to see it in the news because I was teaching some of these items and I also had a um, international business class that I started to talk about this in um, and started to, to talk about, you know, what, what we mean when we have brand and how we show that. Um, and it used to be, um, in fact, up until 2020 and 2021, um, that public facing employees were not allowed beards or natural black hairstyles or braids. Um, and there were gender differences. What women were required to wear was significantly different from what men were required. Um, and business, pier business piercings and tattoos, even if they were covered, were not allowed. Um, and so they have now shifted that. So they have now allowed those things. They can have business-like piercings uh, as of 2021. 
Um, covered tattoos are also now allowed and people are allowed to wear black hairstyles, which is probably very useful for getting ready in the morning. Um, the Wall Street Journal, interestingly enough, uh, said the policy shift comes shortly after UPS hired its first female chief executive. Um, and, and she has said to celebrate diversity rather than corporate restrictions. So it intrigued me, in fact, that this was attributed to the fact that she was female. Maybe she had a bit more insight to having to dress to a norm um, and wanted to open up those restrictions or maybe a bit more of an understanding of listening. I'm not sure what was meant exactly by that, but it struck me as interesting. Um, and then the UPS said it updated its policies after she listened to feedback from employees who said the changes would make them more likely to recommend UPS as an employer. So certainly starting to feel the tightness around making sure that we have employees in our market that are great and realizing maybe that they were um, not having them in. Um, as a footnote, however, uh, UPS did also pay a settlement of 4.9 million to settle on a discrimination lawsuit from the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and bears a, um, with regard to restrictions on beards, not bears, beards and hair length that was happened two years prior. Um, so that might also have had a little something to do with it. Um, but when we think about these bans on being authentic, frankly, I was surprised that in 2020, they still were restricting these things. Um, so it was intriguing to see what my students thought of that. They also, of course, as expected, would, were shocked um, that anybody would worry about these things. Um, and then it really struck me as well to start thinking about what is the difference between policy, practice, and social norms, right? As a, as a um, information security professional for many years, I always think about the difference between policy and practice and social norms um, and how they implement Im impact those and certainly thinking about those as it comes to feeling, making people feel integral and belonging. Um, what is the policy versus what is the practice versus what are the social norms? Um, is interesting, but certainly seems like a, a step forward, even if that does seem to catch up with where we, we probably should have been, you know, 20 years ago. Um, the other thing that struck me is the ability to talk about race. Um, you know, we have this, this talk with our kids. I don't know, you know, no one looks forward, I think, to the sex conversation with kids. Kids don't look forward to it. The drug conversation, nobody looks forward to that on either side. Um, I remember when I was a kid growing, you know, your mom told you what? Um, I mean, nobody's really comfortable with that on either side, but it turns out that uh, that conversation happens for Black families a lot on race um, and what's appropriate behavior, um, dealing with police and criminal justice system, and how do they stay safe. Um, and I think it is imparted on us as well as all parents to really have that conversation about race as well as that conversation about sex and drugs um, at the right point in time and in the right ways. Um, and it's hard to talk about race. I know for myself, um, when I was asked to do the Bergren Forum, which I represent, which I talked about earlier, I could have covered lots of different things, you know, living and working in India for four years, the transition from corporate to academia. But when I looked around and I looked at my students and I talked to them and I realized that I, I needed to address this topic and I needed to start moving forward. And the feedback that I received from students and other faculty members who are doing things differently now, and from my peers and my colleagues and people who I don't know um, on the importance of that conversation and how happy they were that I tried to tackle it and share those insights um, made me continue that and frankly made me continue with it again when um, the SDM and Naomi asked me to do this presentation today. Um, it's hard. You might put your foot in the mouth. You might go viral on something you said that was not quite right or bad, um, but please do it anyway. And I'm continuing to try and push myself forward to do it anyway. Um, to realize that that's how we're going to make the change and that's how we're going to make everybody feel like they belong and, and help the world move forward, right, in our country and, and our places. Um, so consider that as, as the, well, you have the choice perhaps to talk about race, unlike others uh, may have, um, you know, please, please do it anyway. The other thing that comes up with regard to um, COVID that is brought into our life is this code switching. Um, I, have, I don't know, I'm, everybody's heard about code switching, um, but it's essentially the practice of switching from one social code and language to another, usually between two culturals or personal life and work or public persona. Um, I think when we hear about this, most of us would say, well, of course we do that. There's things that we do like in our homes with our family or with our friends that we would never do in the office. And, and how far away is that? How different is that? Right? Um, and how comfortable do you feel with that? And, and there's a number of people who, and even with my students, you know, do you force them to turn on their cameras? Are they able to turn on their cameras? What else is going in, on in their houses? Um, where are they having to do classes? 
um, you know, the, 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 a lot of the um, feedback that we're reading and especially people are experiencing is, you know, I don't, and, and even some of my relatives, I know my daughter-in-law was mentioning, you know, and I, I turn on my camera, they're asking me about like stuff on my fridge. I don't have an office like they have, right? I don't have a separate room for this, <laughs> like some people have. Um, and suddenly those people are in your house, right? And in your life and they see you helping your little sibling with homework or you're, you know, having to do baby duty or whatever else it might be. Um, I grabbed this picture of myself, a video snippet from maybe not the best moment of me teaching a class on intro to MIS, um, talking about the Amazon supply chain with my one of my nine-year-old twins hopping in to give his two cents on the Amazon supply chain and his hour of code work, um, right? Wearing my natural hair, if you will. Uh, maybe not my best picture, but I wanted to share that just as a, as a reminder um, that as we make people feel integral, and although it's really nice to see faces and it's really helps with the relationship, it may be a little too much for some people to have that uh, intrusion into their life um, and how are they feeling and what do they do and, and just some sensitivity to a, another view of that lens. Um, so I wanted to, to share that kind of code switching in COVID for things um, on what we might want to say. So. I don't know about you, but from the work that I've done and the listening that I've done and research and, and trying to immerse myself in these different um, different walks and look for the truth, I've been inspired to do a number of things. Um, one of them to get better step by potentially awkward step, in fact, likely awkward step, um, to tackle, tackle topics and risk offense and embarrassment in the interest of enabling engagement and inspiration for all, to assume good intention, ask to understand, seek common ground. I've been, inspired to add a brave space statement to my syllabi and in my class that declares my intent and welcomes feedback, to review research and incorporate likely and proven methods to engage, including the implementation of my engagement checklist. I'm hoping others will, and maybe we can convert it to corporate as well, um, to improve my engagement, helping others identify their potential North Stars and supporting them on their path. And while all that time appreciating each person as an individual and listen and identify what their what their skills and aspirations are as them and not as what they should be based on social norms. Um, and I would like to ask as well, thank you for listening and kind of what are you inspired to do? Um, follow up, I've included my email either at Alfred or my uh, forever address for alum.mit.edu. And if there are any questions, thank you for listening. And thank you to all the voices that were shared with me and, and feedback and people, you know, dealing with me, putting my foot in my mouth and being willing to have those conversations and follow up with me. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, I want to reiterate to our audience that they can leave questions in the chat window to the right of the video on our YouTube page. While we are waiting for those to come in, I just wanted to note that I think the systems approach to kind of creating more inclusion, creating a more welcoming space for students is a really good one. Um, one thing that came up a lot in our students' presentations last week for our final projects in the uh, systems design and management core class is the approach of iterating. You know, you figure out what you think is a solution, you try it out, and then you improve on it. Uh, what do you think is a good way to kind of bring that approach to the classroom, for instance? Yeah, I would say absolutely, Naomi, and I'm doing it all the time, frankly. Um, so I, I try these things and I try different things. And then I also, um, you know, usually I, I specifically ask for feedback, if, you know, whenever I get a chance with, with individual students or somebody's on early or whatever we have or somebody in the room. But I also specifically do surveys mid midterm. And of course, the final survey, we have our formal um, formal satis you know, customer satisfaction survey, as I like to call it, being from the corporate world. Um, but also that gives some feedback. And then I also offer my own survey um, so I can get some specific feedback around different things that I've tried. Um, I also think that some of these things are um, a continual challenge to maintain. Um, I myself have a heck of a time with any names and faces. So for my constant, I just have to constantly remind myself and work on using names and remembering to try and, and, and separate people and, and work on those names and faces and realizing how, how, how important it is. Um, and working on, you know, having those conversations with people and, and trying to understand them and where they're coming from and what their aspirations are, are all kind of worthy parts and part of that feedback. And of course, they change as well through the years um, that we see them. Um, so I think those are different, some different ways to do. 
Um, I also, in fact, we're, I'm working on some research um, with some colleagues of mine on experiential learning, and we have a framework called Feeble that we're working to validate that against. Um, so we've also surveyed our students and we're trying to understand the differences between a few of the ways that we offer our courses and real world experience versus simulated experience versus you know, lecture on, on different areas and seeing what the differences are and changing those identities. Um, so we're hoping that those surveys yield some results and insights. That makes a lot of sense. And I think experiential learning is another thing where figuring out how to make it accessible and welcoming to as many students as possible is a challenge, uh, but a necessary one to pursue. So we have a question from Kevin Shockey. Do you have pointers on how to be culturally respective in new environments? <laughs> yeah, I think I have to say, I think the answer is always humility and listening and come from an area of, and there's, there's a lot of research, right, as someone who worked in foreign cultures or different cultures than my own for 10 years, lived and worked in other countries, um, you know, that research that says, um, you know, listen, humility, pay attention to cues, assume respect, um, and, and continue to open up those conversations to have those. Um, and, and realize that those different cultures aren't just the ones that are overseas, but in fact, they're here at home. Um, I know when I was working, when I moved from engineering to marketing, that was a huge cultural shift for me, um, despite it being in the same company and sometimes even in the same building. Um, and realizing immediately that you are in a cultural shift and you need to you know, put on those listening ears and treat people with respect and humility and not assume um, the stories that are behind that is, is significantly helpful and useful. And again, there are lots of resources out there potentially to help you do that as well. Um, and it's worth making sure that you surround yourself and, and engage with people who may give you some insights to that, right? It may, it may cost you a coffee or some lunches or some, some sort of interaction um, that's required, um, but definitely consider doing that and using that. Hopefully that, that helps. I think that makes sense to me. I know that with SDM because our students are often coming back from the corporate world or the work world to a university environment that itself is a huge culture shift and if people are coming from a very homogenous work environment or a very regimented one to MIT where we certainly have all of our own cultural codes but they're unique in a lot of ways and also academia is unlike a lot of work environments uh, it can definitely be a transition period for a lot of them. Uh, we Absolutely. have a question from Shahrukh Mushtaq. Uh, can you share some insights on faith-based racism and how we can counter it at workplace, universities, et cetera? Sure, absolutely. And in fact, part of the, um, the UPS story is kind of faith-based racism, right? There's a few races that, that encourage beards or even require them. And to say that you can't have any beards, you know, is definitely an issue associated with that requiring people to get waivers um, specifically to do that is certainly a problem. Um, and I think it does go back again to that, how, how are you integral, right? And how, are you, how do you have that sense of belonging? Um, and, and there's certainly issues for how you have your authentic self associated with that, right? So are you part of a, a faith that doesn't drink, for instance, or doesn't dance? And, and the organization that you've joined requires you to do a lot of that. Um, that might be a problem, right? There's a social fabric and how does that work and how do you get in with the crowds that are the movers and shakers? Um, and, and, and again, it draws us back to questioning the organizations that we're creating, right? As we get to the points where we actually create the culture rather than are you know, trying to be successful in a culture that's there that we can't influence significantly, um, other than being there or not being there, maybe, or maybe being a little annoying, um, I think it really makes us question, you know, what does it require to be part of this culture and is it related to the job or is it related to other things that might be an issue, right? Hours that you work, holidays that you have, all of these things are worth considering um, as you think, are, you know, am I really open to all of these faiths? And, and when we think about that, if we really think about the, the war for talent, right, and how do we get the right people to join our organizations um, and how do we get the most successful people that are really going to be the ones that can contribute to us? Um, we really, really need to think about how we are open to the best candidates, not based on fit, which usually means, you know, social fabric fit, rather than the best skills and talents. And how, how do we make an organization that can use those talents by being flexible 
with regard to you know prayer time, work times versus non-work times, what we do, and again, how we make that social fabric and what activities are expected um, and when those are expected and how can we make that open and, and available to everyone and, and be flexible without making judgments associated with that. I think that is a really good answer, at least for a start. Um, a question from B. Theophilus Mambu, who asks, kind of a more general question. Do you need to process the systems approach in your mind and then apply it? It might be costly, maybe emotionally or psychologically to try various methods of interacting. Um, well, I find my for myself, it's impossible to not turn my systems mind on. Um, that's just, that's just how it goes. Um, so it's certainly, um, it, it certainly is costly from a from a usage perspective, but it's always trying to work on puzzles. So, in fact, my my more difficult thing is sorting stuff into discrete black and white. Um, there's constantly uh, leverage all over. But from a trying it on and, and specifically um, implementing these things, as well as the empathy that's required and the learning that's required, and when you listen. Um, you know, it's definitely taxing from an emotional perspective as well, as well as kind of facing your demons and your experiences and, you know, looking at my past and realizing kind of the, the tone deaf things that I have done and I am sure will continue to do and hopefully someone will tell me and I will be able to fix them. Um, but certainly looking in that past is, is definitely emotionally taxing, but I think something that is worthy of doing if we're going to move forward and be more competitive and, and continue to have and engage you know, all, all parts of all parts of the community and society in a positive way. And that's certainly the, the organization that and, and reality in society that I want my children to grow up in. Um, I want that be how other people look at them and how they accept them for whatever it is that they have. And, and I'm hoping that vice versa is true as well. So whatever I need to do and however I need to tax myself to make that a reality, I will continue to do. Yes, I think that's entirely fair. And I would also like to take this chance to remind the audience that if you would like to see more webinars on systems approaches to a wide variety of topics, the archive of our webinars is here on our YouTube channel. Um, I think most of them are more technical or more engineering heavy in their approaches, but I think it's definitely worth looking at how that framework can be applied elsewhere. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us, Jean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know Doug Hag did one last year, I think, on ethics and AI um, that yes. I think holds some, you know, is, is, a, is a merge between the two, if you will, um, that starts to look at those models and certainly those things around coded gaze out of the MIT Media Lab with Joy are, are definitely worth um, taking a look at and understanding from a bias built perspective and, and those kind of weapons of mass destruction as they're, you know, as the book is, in, as one of the books is entitled. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think the other side of it is it may be costly either upfront or as an ongoing part of these processes to continue to iterate, to continue to ask questions and improve. But if you don't do that, the cost is almost certainly going to be borne somewhere else. And it's really just figuring out what you think is worth investing in. Absolutely, Naomi. And I think um, on that, I have to say that the feedback that I've gotten certainly makes up for the, the risks and the, and the um, kind of uh, work that it's taken, if you will. Um, so if I can, if I can move, you know, one of, if I, one of those stories is worth a lot, frankly, of real change in the world. Um, is definitely a positive move forward. Absolutely. All right. It looks like we are all through the questions, so I think we will take this opportunity to wrap up. Thank you again, Jean, for joining us and for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. And I'd like to thank our audience for attending the webinar. Once again, this presentation has been recorded and it will be available here on the same URL at YouTube after this session. We will be taking the summer off from the webinar series, but we will return in the fall of 2021. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.